All right, all right. Happy Friday, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Abayami Asakiwi. He is the editor of Pan African Newswire. Welcome, Abayami. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. So I guess I'll get started with this because I, I know uh, a lot of us have been discussing the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Uh, I think I've been talking about Israel and Palestine for at least pff, almost three years. At least I know the first year of the show is when I started talking about it. But I have noticed that there doesn't seem to be a lot discussion about some of the other humanitarian crises that are happening uh, all over the world, in particular countries in Africa. And Sudan has uh, been brought to my attention now uh, about last year, I believe, I talked about the fact that I thought uh, that Sudan was going to be the next proxy war. And that was based off of a video footage that I saw from Al Jazeera. And now I'm reading that there is also a humanitarian crisis in Sudan and people are starving there as well. So first and foremost, uh, if you could please educate the audience, uh, why is this humanitarian crisis happening in Sudan? Uh, and is this connected to uh, the war conflict uh, that was discussed over a year ago? Well, on April 15th of last year, uh, 2023, uh, there was an open hostile military split between the two main uh, armed forces in the Republic of Sudan. You have the Sudanese Armed Forces, uh, which is headed uh, by General Al Fatah Al Burhan. And then there's the Rapid Support Forces that is uh, head, headed by Mohamed Delgado, also known as Hamete. Uh, these two factions. Uh, fell out completely. Uh, they had a disagreement on, on the way forward uh, in regard to the demand uh, by the masses of people in uh, Sudan for a democratic uh, transition. These are well-armed uh, military units, and they have been fighting it out uh, at the expense of the civilian population in Sudan now for almost 14 months. Now, this has precipitated a huge humanitarian crisis. Millions of people have fled the country. Uh, some have gone uh, over towards uh, Port Sudan on the Red Sea and moved into Saudi Arabia and other areas in West Asia. Some have crossed over into the Republic of South Sudan, which used to be a part of the Republic of Sudan, uh, which also uh, has its own internal problems. So the humanitarian crisis is worsening uh, because repeated attempts uh, to try to get the two military uh, armed wings uh, to sit down together and hammer out an agreement uh, has not worked. Uh, the armed forces headed by General Burhan uh, wants a outright military victory against the RSF. The RSF has indicated that it does want to engage in peace talks, yet the uh, Sudanese armed forces leader, uh, General Burhan, uh, is not willing uh, to engage in these type of uh, dialogues. So that is the root cause of the crisis, and it continues, and there are still efforts on the part of the African Union, on the part of the Republic of South Sudan, as well as uh, the United Nations to try to bring about a truce uh, between these two factions. And you're right, uh, it has been overshadowed uh, by the situation in Gaza, uh, and of course, uh, it is related, of course, uh, to the situation in Gaza because the United States uh, has been attempting for many years to control the situation in Sudan. They have uh, instigated conflict uh, for at least a decade and a half, and they're continuing uh, to interfere in the internal affairs of the Republic of Sudan, and therefore there's a lot of apprehension and unwillingness to even engage with the United States at this point in regard to the way forward in uh, the Republic of Sudan. So some of the Sudanese people have become refugees in other countries. And I'm, I'm kind of curious uh, because we've heard uh, yet again that uh, other Arab nations do not want to uh, take in uh, Palestinian people. Of course, uh, a lot of right wing politicians have been using that 
uh, basically as their support uh, for Israel. And they've basically said, well, none of these other countries want to take them in. So that ought to tell you something. But uh, I don't feel that way. I do feel as though it's not those other countries' responsibilities to fix the problems uh, that the U.S. government and Israel has caused. However, I, I, I'm curious about the sentiment in those countries that Sudanese refugees have now uh, moved to or are residing in right now. How are they being treated in those countries and, and do they feel welcome there? It's a mixed bag. Uh, in Egypt, there's been problems uh, because uh, Egypt itself is facing profound uh, economic uh, crises. Uh, they are under a international monetary fund restructuring program and therefore they're required to cut uh, government spending and spending on public uh, institutions inside the country. Uh, in South Sudan, they themselves as well uh, have tremendous uh, economic and humanitarian problems. South Sudan exists because of a split uh, between the Republic of Sudan and the Republic of South Sudan, uh, which gained uh, full independence in 2011. Uh, they also have undergone uh, internal problems as well. So you cannot blame necessarily uh, African countries or West Asian countries for being reluctant uh, to bring in additional uh, displaced persons. In regard to the Palestinian issue, uh, there are millions of Palestinians who are outside of Palestine. Uh, many of them live in Jordan, in Syria, uh, in other places, even in Egypt itself. So that's why they do not want to come to an agreement uh, with the Palestinians uh, because they would have to have a right of return. And if all the Palestinians who have been displaced uh, at least since 1948, and there were those who were displaced before that, uh, would be well over uh, seven to eight million uh, Palestinians. Uh, and they could easily outvote uh, the Israeli settlers in a general uh, democratic multi-party election. So all of these problems, as you mentioned before, uh, have been instigated uh, by US foreign policy and of course, why should other countries who are also struggling, who are also uh, dealing with underdevelopment, who also have to uh, accept the World Bank and International Monetary Fund bailouts, uh, why should they have to bear the brunt of uh, the activities that stem directly from US foreign policy in Africa and also in West Asia? That's right. That's very well said. And another point I want to bring up as well, uh, this idea of a genocide. Would you consider what's happening in Sudan right now to be a genocide and why or why not? No, I don't consider it uh, to be a genocide because uh, they're all African people. You have different ethnic groups, uh, for example, in the Darfur region. Um, two decades ago, there was a tremendous amount of accusations against the former government of uh, President Hassan al-Bashir, uh, charging him with genocide against the people, some of the people in the West Darfur region. However, a, a number of objective analyses of that crisis, <clears throat> beginning in the early uh, 2000s, uh, say that it was not genocide, that the US and Western countries were using that allegation uh, to in fact weaken uh, the Republic of Sudan, to split the country and to also bring it back under the complete influence of the United States. We have to understand that prior uh, to the partition of the country uh, in uh, 2011, uh, that uh, Sudan was emerging as one of the largest and most profitable oil producing states uh, in the world. Uh, also geographically, they represented the largest geographic nation state in Africa. So there was much incentive on the part of the United States and other Western imperialist powers particularly Britain as well, because it was a former British colony. Uh, they wanted to weaken Sudan uh, by uh, overthrowing its government. Uh, the uh, International Criminal Court had actually issued warrants against uh, the former president of the Republic of Sudan, uh, charging him with uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even genocide. So we have to take these things into consideration. Now, if they're charging genocide in Sudan, then why won't they charge or accept the charge of genocide in Palestine? Uh, because they have interests in Palestine that requires the settler colonial class that has been dominating there since 1948. It is like a major military and political outpost for imperialism uh, in West Asia and North Africa. So no, I would not consider the situation in Sudan as a genocide, 
although what is going on there is highly disturbing. It is a humanitarian crisis, and it's imperative uh, that the two factions um, reach a peace agreement and also move back towards reaching some type of uh, democratization process. Uh, since uh, the uh, uprising in 2018 and 2019, which led to the demise of uh, President al-Bashir's government, uh, the masses there want democracy. They want a multi-party democratic system. But the military, which is so entrenched in the economy and within the state, does not want to relinquish power. And this has a lot to do uh, with the fact that the fighting is still going on. Hmm. Well, one, another thing that we've discussed on the show is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So I was reading recently that over 6 million people have been killed in the Congo. I, I do know one of the resources in the Congo, uh, cobalt, uh, is heavily desired. For those who are not aware, cobalt can be used for rechargeable batteries. Uh, so it is a very uh, resource-rich uh, area. Um, when you look at what's happening in the Congo, why do you feel... And, and, and tell me the truth. You feel it because it's African country, because why do you feel that mainstream media and some independent media isn't really talking much about what's happening in the Congo when over 6 million people have been killed there when you do compare it to uh, the death toll in Gaza? Why do you feel more people aren't talking about that? Well, here again, uh, the Western imperialist countries have vast interests uh, in Congo. We have to go back to the 1870s the 1880s all the way up to the early part of the 20th century, where it's estimated that eight to 10 million Africans were slaughtered uh, in Congo uh, by the Belgian uh, monarchy, uh, Leopold uh, I, and also later uh, by the Belgian government, which took over control of the administration of Congo around 1908. Even after uh, that period of colonization in 1959, uh, the independence movement uh, was led uh, by Patrice Lumumba. Uh, he was imprisoned, and then he had to be released because of the widespread support that he had in the country. When he did win the prime ministership in 1960, the U.S., and this is well documented, people like Larry Devlin, uh, former President uh, Dwight Eisenhower, all sought to overthrow uh, the Lumumba government because he wanted to build a national uh, government. He, he believed in Pan-Africanism, and he believed in anti-imperialism, and he was overthrown, later executed in 1961, and since that time, uh, the country has been highly unstable. Uh, even with the overthrow of Mobutu Sese Seko in 1997, there were still problems uh, with the intervention of Rwanda and Uganda in uh, 1998, uh, led to a five-year war that brought in the Southern African development community, along with others uh, on the side of Uganda and Rwanda. Of course, uh, now it appears as if in the western part of the country, in the central part of the country, uh, it is somewhat stable. But however, in the east, the mineral rich east, uh, which borders on Rwanda and Uganda, uh, conflict continues. Uh, people are still being killed, they're being displaced. And of course, it, it has not been uh, the, the regional countries, the East African community and EGOD and the others have not uh, been able to bring peace and stability in the DRC. Uh, you don't hear a lot about what's going on in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo because, as you mentioned before, uh, it's overshadowed uh, by what's going on in Palestine, what's going on in Ukraine, uh, the hostility towards China, the DPRK, and so forth. Uh, but fortunately, there are publications uh, that focus on African affairs, and they do report on a regular basis what is going on in the DRC as well. That's right. I remember, um, I don't know how old everyone is in the audience, but I do remember uh, the genocide in Rwanda. I remember uh, the Clinton administration. In the beginning, they actually said that there was not a genocide happening in Rwanda. And I just want to say this to people because I want people to think about what our, what the administration is saying now. You know, different president, but still. Uh, they said there was not a genocide in Rwanda. And then later on, they had to come back and apologize. Uh, and Bill Clinton, I think, till this day, sometimes when he does interviews, he says that 
that that was a bad decision for him to make at that point in time, that he was incorrect, that there was a genocide that was happening in Rwanda. And so I just, I say these things because I want people to sometimes just go back through history, not even that long ago, like you said, 1998. So not long ago, just go back through history and think about some of the ways our administration has denied uh, that people were being slaughtered uh, abroad. Uh, and I, I pivot back to Sudan because I want to mention this. This is actually something that was highlighted by the Middle East Eye. So we all know Macklemore, uh, he made the song for Gaza, which I thought is it's a great song. It's very powerful. Uh, there are now uh, activists, and I want to pull this up here. Activists are, are calling on Macklemore. They say, keep your eyes on Sudan too. Uh, activists urge Macklemore to cancel Dubai concert. And I want to get into this a little bit for people who are not aware. And I'll just uh, slide a little bit forward here. Uh, so it talks about the song that he released for Gaza. Then it says, now almost a month after its release, social media users are calling on Macklemore to cancel his upcoming concert in the UAE due to the country's role in Sudan's civil war. And I want to get your take about this as well, uh, Abiyami, because uh, how is the United Arab uh, Arab Emirates, how are they involved in Sudan? And what do you think? Do you think Macklemore should also uh, back out of this concert as well? They are involved, uh, Dubai, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, stepped in uh, after the fall of the Al-Bashir government and pledged billions of dollars uh, to try to stabilize uh, the Sudanese uh, government, even under the military. And this was problematic uh, because the majority of the people inside the country were marching, demonstrating, engaging in nonviolent uh, activity because they wanted a democratic dispensation. And that actually propped up uh, the military regime. But that was to no avail uh, because the two major factions within the military have now turned on each other. So there's no real military solution uh, to the crisis in Sudan. It has to be a political solution. Uh, so I don't know if that artist uh, understands that, and uh, it's up to him and his management whether or not they're going to uh, cancel the concert or not. Uh, we, a lot of times we don't know exactly what's at stake in these type of deals uh, that take place, uh, but there's a lot of uh, Western investment as well uh, in the UAE. But what's interesting is that uh, over the last uh, couple of years, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which had been at odds, uh, over the whole situation in West Asia and the Persian Gulf uh, have normalized relations. And this has proved to be a problem for the United States uh, because they are unable at this point to pit the UAE and Saudi Arabia against the Islamic Republic of Iran and other countries and the resistance movements uh, that have sprung up in West Asia, in uh, Syria, Iraq, what's going on now in Lebanon and South Lebanon and also in Yemen which has taken a lead role uh, in an attempt to impose a blockade against uh, the Israeli ports. I think that uh, the UAE uh, is undergoing a transformation, at least in regard to its uh, foreign policy. And that has helped uh, in a lot of ways to isolate uh, the US uh, in that region. So what do we do to, or, or what should, how can African countries get the West uh, out of their business. And I ask that because it's, it's obvious, like a lot of these problems are initiated or instigated by the West, particularly the United States government. Uh, how do they get the U S government out of their countries? And is, is it possible for those countries to actually just lead their own people without any interference from the West? It is possible. Uh, it was done uh, prior to the 15th and 16th century, uh, when the so-called Western Hemispheric nations, uh, the great powers of the world, uh, for example, the United States and Canada, uh, were not the center of the world economic system. Uh, the centers was in uh, the Indian Ocean Basin, in Africa, and various parts of Asia. We see that returning uh, in a limited degree but we can see developments that are going on now that prefigure uh, the displacement of Western imperialism as the center of the world economic system. 
If we look at what's going on in these small countries in the Sahel region in West Africa, for example, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, even Chad to a certain degree uh, today, they have asked France and the United States to take their military forces out of the country. This has been a, a profound shock, uh, particularly to the Biden administration, uh, because uh, they don't understand the dynamics of what's going on now uh, in various uh, African countries. So that is one example of what could take place. Uh, other examples, uh, we have the formation of the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa Plus Summit, the BRICS Summit, uh, which is expanded to bring in other countries such as Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Even though these countries don't have the same uh, type of political system, they don't have ideological uniformity, uh, but they do uh, indicate that there's a strong desire on the part of the majority of the population of the peoples of the world to break uh, with the hegemony of Western imperialism. Uh, for example, the uh, G77 plus China is another formation that encompasses approximately 80% of the world's population. Uh, we have a revival within the non-aligned movement um, that uh, encompasses a huge uh, percentage of the world's population. The African Union, uh, despite all of its problems, despite all of its weaknesses, has been able to stand up against uh, U.S. imperialism as it relates to the war in Ukraine, uh, not supporting uh, the uh, aggressive policies of the United States uh, uh, backing uh, the Ukrainian regime and creating the conditions that could spiral into World War III. And also on Palestine, uh, the AU has, has issued uh, pretty strong statements on the situation in Palestine. Uh, they have backed the uh, South African uh, lawsuit against the state of Israel under the Genocide Convention. It's a slow process, uh, but I believe uh, that there's no other alternative uh, than for these countries, these geopolitical regions to exert their independence, to unify, and to reclaim uh, their rightful place uh, in the world. Uh, the United States at this point uh, has only one option, it appears, and that is the military option. And it hasn't worked uh, in Eastern Europe. We look at what's going on in Ukraine and Russia. The Russian economy has gotten stronger uh, mm -hmm. since uh, they embarked upon the special military operation. Uh, they have not been able to defeat the resistance in Palestine. They've killed over 37,000 people officially, uh, but uh, the resistance forces are still fighting. So I think that uh, the geopolitical regions of the world outside of the West, and even those populations inside of Canada, inside the United States, inside of Western Europe, too, are growing larger, and they're uh, developing a sense of awareness and unity. So I think it's inevitable uh, that we're going to undergo a profound transformation of the international uh, powers, relationships, and also the, the international structures uh, which have governed foreign relations uh, over the last uh, 200 years. Do you think that other African countries should entertain uh, applying to be a part of BRICS? Uh, we know South Africa is a part of it, but what about some of the other countries in Africa? Would that be beneficial uh, for them? And should they be open to maybe some type of help from China or Russia? I've, I've heard different opinions about this from people. Some people feel that, uh, you know, China is is helping countries in Africa. And then I've heard from other people that not everyone in Africa is really, I, I guess, welcoming uh, China's presence, uh, same with Russia. What do you think about that, the possibility of other African countries joining BRICS? Others have applied. They're very interested in joining. And uh, I think it will happen eventually. I think China now uh, being perhaps the largest trading partner uh, with uh, the African Union member states, they have built up infrastructure in various countries. Uh, in East Africa, they built uh, railway systems, uh, rapid transit systems. Uh, they constructed uh, the African Union uh, headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, state-of-the-art uh, office uh, complex there. And they're doing other, working in other projects across Africa. The same situation with the Russian Federation. A lot of African countries were engaged in trade, uh, particularly in the area of grain and other agricultural products, plus agricultural inputs such as fertilizer and machinery uh, were being supplied uh, by the Russian Federation as well as Ukraine. That's why um, 
immediately after the beginning of the uh, Russian special military operation in Ukraine uh, in February of 2022, uh, the African Union sent a delegation uh, to both Russia and Ukraine uh, asking for a mediated uh, settlement uh, in the conflict. And uh, they rebuffed uh, the U.S. Uh, State Department uh, Assistant uh, Secretary Mali Fee for Africa, who tried to intimidate uh, African journalists, African governments into accepting the U.S. position on uh, Ukraine. But no, uh, what's happening is very detrimental uh, to the food supply in Africa and the production of agricultural goods uh, on the continent. Uh, countries like Egypt, for example, uh, received a tremendous amount of agricultural uh, products and trade uh, from both Russia and Ukraine. So that's why the African Union countries are saying this war needs to stop. It needs to be settled diplomatically. And this is what the Biden administration is opposed to. They have struck down every attempt uh, to try to mediate the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, there were negotiations initially in Belarus right after the war started, and then later in Turkey. Uh, and the United States sabotaged those negotiations. There was also the Minsk Accords, uh, which was signed uh, in 2014, 2015, uh, around that time period, and they were sabotaged as well. So this is Biden's war. And uh, as a result of it, uh, the US government is suffering. Uh, the people in Western Europe and Africa and other geopolitical regions of the world are suffering. And I do not believe uh, that the US, by backing Ukraine, that they will prevail. Uh, many, many Ukrainians have been killed and uh, many have left the country. And right now they have a very difficult time even recruiting soldiers uh, into the Ukrainian uh, military. And the Russians are involved in an offensive right now. And the only solution uh, that we hear coming out of the White House is to send more weapons, to engage in more provocative military actions against Russia. So yes, that is the problem that we're facing right now. And the U.S., even in regard to Sudan, could have done a much better job in bringing about a democratic uh, transformation. They attempted under the Trump administration uh, to have the Republic of Sudan to recognize the state of Israel, uh, to undermine uh, solidarity with the Palestinians. And that was their policy across the entire West Asia and North Africa region. And that policy has failed completely right now. And uh, even Saudi Arabia, uh, has not normalized relations with Israel. And even Egypt right now, which had normalized relations with Israel back uh, 45 years ago, it's very strained, the relationship now between Egypt and the state of Israel uh, because of the problems that are going on at the Rafah border crossing and other issues that are impacting Egypt as well as the Palestinians. So I think the United States itself has to change its foreign policy and they feel they cannot afford to change their foreign policy because without uh, being hegemonic and domineering in terms of political, economic, and military strength, uh, they feel they have no future uh, in the evolving uh, world system. Well said. Uh, here's a question, a great question here from a kid. Uh, please ask the guests if there are any leaders or a specific movement in Africa that could unite them. Good question. Yeah, I think um, if we look at what's happening in the Sahel region, uh, although these are military regimes uh, that have taken such an anti-French and anti-US position, and we have to look at the African Union Charter itself, which calls for unity, eventual unification, uh, the introduction of a currency, continental-wide uh, AU currency. So yes, I think that uh, people are looking in that direction. I don't think it's any one organization at this point, it will have to be many different political parties, governments, mass organizations coming together uh, to hammer out a program for the future. Abiyami, thank you so much. Uh, one more quick question. Uh, there have also been um, Jamima uh, Pierre. She was on the show to talk about uh, the crisis in Haiti. Uh, and one of the things that she mentioned is that they're trying to actually recruit uh, the U.S. government by they uh, trying to recruit uh, soldiers from Kenya yes. uh, to yes. fight in Haiti. Why yeah, would uh, yeah? Why why would uh, soldiers from African countries choose to go and fight in Haiti? Money. Uh, the president, unfortunately, William Ruto, who was just here last week, 
given a red carpet treatment at the White House, he should know, he should definitely know that Joe Biden, who is waging war in Ukraine, uh, who's backing the genocide against the Palestinians, who's attempting uh, to undermine uh, the strength and the sovereignty of the People's Republic of China does not mean Kenya or Haiti any good. And they wanna send 1,000 Kenyan police uh, to Haiti uh, ostensibly to bring back law and order. But they're not looking at the history of US military and police involvement in Haiti. And at the same time, there's tremendous opposition inside Kenya itself to this deployment of 1,000 police officers to uh, Haiti. Uh, this, the courts there, have said this is not constitutional. There's no provision in the Kenyan constitution uh, that would uh, require or suggest uh, the need for deploying police uh, halfway around the world. So I think uh, William Ruto is making a serious mistake. Uh, he's polarizing his own population. He's in fact alienating the people in Haiti and other progressive forces in the Caribbean. And I do not believe that this will work. Uh, the Courts in Haiti and in Kenya say that, this, that they cannot deploy police to Haiti. He seems to be interested in doing it anyway. So he'll have to pay the price politically uh, if this uh, operation uh, goes awry. And if Kenyan police are killed there, and if they in fact uh, defeated uh, in some type of uh, military conflict that would take place in Haiti. Hmm. Well, Ab Abami, um, Abayimi, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for the invitation. Bye. Bye.